Hello everyone, in this video we're going to derive the most general solution to the wave equation. Uh, we're going to ignore damping for the moment, I'm going to cover that in my next video, but the undamped wave equation is shown at the top left here. I derived this a couple of videos ago. Now the method we're going to use is to take the Fourier transform of this partial differential equation. Now there are other quicker methods to derive the general solution of this equation, but I do feel like some of the very quick methods almost require you to know the solution in advance, whereas taking the Fourier transform is a pretty standard method when you're solving a partial differential equation. So that's why I'm choosing to, uh, to, to do it this way. Now, because this equation uh, contains derivatives both with respect to time and with respect to position x, we've got to choose whether to take a spatial Fourier transform or a temporal Fourier transform. Now, either of those will work, but I'm going to choose to take the temporal Fourier transform. And so let me just show you the definition that I'm going to use because there are various definitions around. Um, so my y tilde, which is the temporal Fourier transform of y, right, uh, is just the integral of y times e to the minus i omega t with respect to time, overall values of time, right? Under this convention, the inverse Fourier transform, in other words, to get back to y as a function of x and t, uh, it's an integral over all values of omega of y tilde times e to the i omega t, but then you've got to divide by 2 pi as well. So let's see what happens if we actually go ahead and take the Fourier transform of our original PDE. Now, what I mean by that is you just take the whole equation, which I'm going to write as dot dot dot, you multiply the entire equation by e to the minus i omega t, and then you just integrate both sides of your equation uh, over all values of time. Now, the reason this is a useful thing to do is that differentiation in real space corresponds to multiplication by i omega in Fourier space. Now, that's a result that I derived in my last video, so you can have a look at that if you're interested. But basically what that means in practice is that this first term in our partial differential equation, d2y by dt squared, in Fourier space is just going to be i omega squared times y tilde of x and omega, right? So this is why Fourier transforming differential equations is useful, because it turns derivatives into just multiplication. Um, the second term in our original PD, we can't use that trick with because we took the, uh, the temporal Fourier transform and that's a spatial derivative. So we're going to have to leave that second term as minus C squared uh, and then just the second spatial derivative D2 by DX squared of Y tilde of X and omega. Uh, the right hand side is still zero because the Fourier transform of zero is just zero. Now I'm just going to rewrite that equation in a slightly tidied up and more concise form by noting that i squared is minus 1. And I'm going to uh, just write the Fourier transform as just y tilde. Don't have to explicitly write the dependence in. I'm going to use a double prime for my second spatial derivative there. So our equation becomes y tilde double prime plus omega over c all squared times y tilde is 0. Now it's useful to define another parameter, I'm going to let k be defined as omega over c, and I'm going to give k a subscript omega just to emphasize that k is really a function of omega, right? It depends on the value of omega rather than just being a constant. Now then, uh, this omega over c all squared in our uh, equation up there is just a k squared, and the, you may recognize this as just the simple harmonic motion equation, right? So this is an equation that pops up all over the place. In physics, I'm not going to derive its solution now, but I'm going to quote its solution, um, which is just y tilde is, well, some constant a times a complex exponential e to the i k subscript omega times x, and then some other constant b times e to the minus i k omega times x. Now, the only thing we've got to be careful with here is that this double primer is really a partial derivative, right? So the a and the b here are not actually constants, but they could depend on omega, right? Because we just took partial derivatives um, with respect to x. So those a and b can, in this case, depend on omega. So we now actually already have a general solution for the Fourier transform of y. Okay, a omega and b omega are arbitrary constants. They could be fixed by boundary conditions and initial conditions, but trying to find the general solution, they're just arbitrary constants. So we can go back to y as a function of x and t by using the inverse Fourier transform now. So um, let's say y of x and t. Uh, the inverse Fourier transform was this thing up at the top right. Okay, So we need to integrate overall values of omega 
and you go from minus infinity to infinity. Now, if uh, we take that expression for y tilde, multiply the whole thing by e to the i m h t, as we have to do in the inverse Fourier transform, you can combine your complex exponential shells together in the following way, right? You're going to get that first term will be a omega times e to the i um, omega t plus k subscript omega of x. Your second term is going to be b subscript omega times e to the i. Um, your omega t is still positive, right? That's just part of the definition of the inverse Fourier transform. But this time you get a minus sign in the spatial part of your exponent. So it's omega t minus k omega times x. And then we just integrate with respect to omega and, uh, and divide by 2 pi. So now I'm going to split my integral into two integrals, right? Uh, for reasons that will become clear in a moment, I'm going to write as the integral over all omega, so minus infinity to infinity of a omega. I'm also going to rewrite my exponent a little bit. So I'm going to write it as i omega. So I'm basically factoring out this omega. Then in my brackets, I'm going to have uh, t plus uh, x over c, which follows from the definition of k omega, right? Because k was defined to be omega over c. So if I'm taking this omega out of the brackets there, uh, my x is now divided by c. So that is going to be an integral over omega divided by 2 pi. And then I'm going to do a very similar thing for the b part, right? So we're going to add on the integral from minus infinity to infinity of b omega, e to the i omega. This time, the only difference is going to be the minus sign. So i omega times uh, t minus x over c, uh, d omega over 2 pi. So the final step is basically just to notice that each of those integrals is well, has exactly the same form as the integral you get in an inverse Fourier transform, except instead of i omega t, you have i omega times this combination, t plus x over c in the first one, and the second one, instead of t, you've got t minus x over c. Okay, so an, an alternative way of writing all that, in fact, a much simpler way of writing uh, all of that stuff out would be, well, the first integral is just some function, right, some function f of t plus x over c, where f is the function whose Fourier transform is a subscript omega, right? So it's just any function of t plus x over c. That follows directly from the definition of the inverse Fourier transform. Similarly, your second integral is just any function g of t minus x over c, where g is the function whose Fourier transform is this b omega over here. Now, this is already a perfectly valid form of the general solution of the wave equation, um, but Let's try to get a little bit more intuition as to what this actually means. Now, to do that, I'm going to factor some uh, well, a constant out of each of the parameters of my f function, my my g function. So for f, I'm going to say it's f of um, c. No, really, it's got to be one over c times x plus c t. Right. The reasons for doing that will become clear in a moment. But I'm just factoring out one over c. Um, I switch the terms around because well. The order of addition doesn't matter. So this is completely equivalent to saying f of 1 over c times x plus ct. Now your second function g, I'm going to factor out this time a minus 1 over c, and we're going to get x minus ct this time. Okay. Now this 1 over c and this minus 1 over c are just constants, right? So they're not really important, and you could in fact just absorb those constants into the definitions of your functions f and g, right? A function of t plus x over c can be written as some other equivalent function of x plus ct because they only differ by a constant. Similarly, a function of t minus x over c can be written as some other function of x minus ct because they just differ by a constant. And so we may as well absorb those constants 1 over c and minus 1 over c into the definitions of the functions, but now they're different functions. So I'm going to call them p and q. So another way of writing a general solution is p of x plus ct, where p is any function, um, plus q of x minus ct, where q is any other function. Now to interpret what this means, you've got to think about transformations of graphs of functions. Imagine when t is zero, right? Your, uh, your displacement y is just p of x plus q of x. Now, as t increases, um, if you add a positive constant to the argument of your function, that, well, graphically, it corresponds to a translation to the left. Okay, So as t increases, you're translating 
your p of x graph further and further to the left and it's translating at a rate of c right because when t increases by one uh, you shift your entire function over by an amount equal to c and therefore um, that first part p of x plus ct corresponds physically to a wave right just some some shape uh, moving to the left with a constant speed of c okay so the interpretation of c is the wave speed and similarly um, if you subtract a positive constant from the argument of your function that graphically corresponds to shifting it to the right um, and again this time it's shifting to the right at a rate of c right when t increases by one x increases by c so c is um, the wave speed again but the the q part of this solution corresponds to any shape any waveform moving to the right translating to the right at a speed of c so it's basically the solution is just um, any waveform traveling to the left superposed with any waveform traveling to the right uh, which intuitively makes sense when you think about it but it's nice that we are able to derive this using standard techniques for solving partial differential equations. Anyway, in my next video, I will say a little bit about uh, what happens when you have damping in your wave equation.